Good evening. My name is Earl Lewis, and I'm the interim dean of the Graduate School. I also serve as chair of the University Wallenberg Selection Committee. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the eighth Wallenberg Lecture and Medal Presentation, an event we all look forward to each fall. This year, we're honoring Semka Kasek Rotem for his courageous actions in Warsaw during World War II. Each Wallenberg lecturer is unique, not only in background and life experiences, but also in the ways in which they responded to life's challenges. All of them, however, are alike in the vigor with which they have defended liberty and human rights. Also, for the care they have given to the persecuted and the oppressed, and in the courage and determination with which they have defended their beliefs. Selecting Simca Rhodium as the 1997 lecturer and medalist upholds the very high standard expected of the Wallenberg lecturer, lecture. We're, also, we're honored to have him with us this evening. On this, the occasion of our eighth lecture, we would also like to recognize the contribution of two people in, in, uh, to the Wallenberg lecture and its efforts. My colleague, Professor Irene Butter, will speak in more detail about their involvement but I would like to comment briefly on the importance of their contributions from my own perspective. Creating an endowment, especially one that would support an annual lecture and medal presentation, is not an endeavor for the faint of heart. Jamie Beth Catlin, however, has always been inspired by challenges, never deterred by them. It is in great measure due to her persistent efforts and steadfast determination that the Wallenberg Lecture and Medal Presentation not only came into existence, but flourished from the very beginning. We owe a great deal of debt to Jamie's dedication. I would also like to recognize the contributions of Susan Lipschitz to the Wallenberg Lecture. Her death in April of this year has left us bereft of a wonderful friend and colleague. During her tenure as Senior Associate Dean in the Graduate School, Susan chaired the Wallenberg Committee and was responsible for ensuring that the lecture and medal presentation was successfully launched and that the standard of excellence established with the first lecture, which featured Ellie Wiesel, will be maintained for all subsequent ones. The diligence and care with which she supervised the Wallenberg Endowment and Lectureship was characteristic of the approach Susan took to what everything she did. In my mind's eye, I can still see her with her quiet dignity and firm sense of right and wrong. She will be missed, but forever remembered this fall and every fall for the ample work she put into making sure this lecture and medal presentation thrive. As many of you know, the University Wallenberg Endowment also provides for the support of an outstanding graduate student who assists the committee with, with the presentation and preparation of a fall lecture. I would like to introduce you to this year's fellow, Ms. Erica Lair, a doctoral student in the Department of Anthropology. Erica. Stand up. <laughs> On behalf of the committee, I would also like to express our appreciation to Dr. Emmanuel Tanai. Dr. Tanai nominated Sumka Rotium for the lectureship, and it's been very helpful to the committee in planning his visit. Dr. Tanai. <laughs> and now, I would like to present to you my distinguished colleague, Professor Emerita Irene Butter, a long-standing member of the Wallenberg Committee and a pivotal figure in her own right. She has done more to, and done, sorry, she has done much, perhaps even more than many, to ensure continued success of the Wallenberg Lecture and all that it represents. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Butter. Thank you very much, Earl. Good evening. Honored guests, Simpa Rotem, President Bollinger, Dean Lewis, and friends. On behalf of the Wallenberg Selection Committee, I take great pleasure in welcoming you. Once more, we come together for our annual Wallenberg Celebration, a celebration of human values and of individuals who through acts of moral courage, stand out in their defense of human values. Today, we start by recognizing two individuals who were pivotal in the creation of the Wallenberg Endowment and Lecture, Jamie Catlin and Susan Lipschitz. 
Jamie Catlin, a long-standing member of the university community, planted the seed for the Wallenberg Project. And this was prompted by her astute realization that one of the most distinguished alumni had been neglected in remembrance on this campus. Because Jamie believed so strongly that we should emphasize to future generation of students how proud we are of Raoul Wallenberg, she persisted in launching the endowment. Having made the first donation to start a Wallenberg fund, she then proceeded to inspire a group of colleagues, including myself, to pursue this endeavor and to get it off the ground. Changes in Jamie's health required that she move away from Ann Arbor. But whether far or near, she continued her support and involvement. We applaud Jamie for her determination, her resilience, and her courage, which is exemplified in her most recent undertaking of a journey to Africa. Please join me in expressing our gratitude and welcoming Jamie back from Africa. After Jamie had planted the seed, Susan Lipschitz saw to it that the project flourished. As Associate Dean of the Rackham School of Graduate Studies, she created a home for the Wallenberg Endowment and Lectureship and left an inedible, in, I'm sorry, indelible imprint on it. <laughs> Susan fought for its place and stature. She gave it its distinguished shape and form, and she nurtured it to attract eminent speakers. When Susan moved to the provost's office, it became immediately apparent how critical she was to the continued blossoming of the project. She continued to serve as a member of the Wallenberg Selection Committee, and her illness never stood in the way of her selfless dedication. Her infinite wisdom and diplomacy enabled her to achieve things within the university structure that no one else could have accomplished. On behalf of the University Wallenberg Selection Committee, we honor Susan for her integrity, her wisdom, and for everything that she gave to the Wallenberg Project. Susan would be so pleased to know that the Wallenberg Lecture continues to reflect humanity in its highest plane. Our speaker today is a remarkable addition to previous Wallenberg medalists. As you know, each of the speakers have reflected the beauty of the human spirit in their own unique way. This applies as well to Simcha Rotem, also known as Kajik, who, as a true resistance fighter, always with a gun in his pocket, joined the Jewish fighting force in Warsaw at a surprisingly young age to give himself a greater degree of freedom in carrying out the many varied duties. He disguised his Jewish identity with a Polish alias. Kazik's book, His Wartime Experiences, Memoirs of a Warsaw Ghetto Fighter, was one I felt compelled to read twice. First, to read the lines themselves, and then to read between the lines. Even after I had read twice, his, I was, still could not fathom the danger, the horror, and the terror which surrounded him during this period. His book raises many questions for the reader. How did he manage at such a young age to assume such enormous responsibilities and to take such incredible risks again and again over an extended period of time? How did he sustain his energy, his vigor, his alertness so that he could instantly make critical decisions with potentially grave consequences? What is it that gave a person like Kajik the unbounded courage and stamina to confront evil directly. 
perhaps you will agree at the end of the evening that Kajik's uniqueness stems from the successful way in which he achieved balance between saving the lives of others and assuring his own survival. Considering that the majority of his comrades were killed in confrontations with the Nazis, and considering the dangers with which he was surrounded constantly, we are extremely grateful, not just for his survival 50 years ago and thereafter, but also for his willingness to travel all the way from Jerusalem to share his wartime experiences with us. Now, before we turn to Kajik, each year on this occasion, we pay tribute, validate, and reaffirm the courageous and heroic leadership of Raoul Wallenberg. As part of this tribute, the Wallenberg story is retold as a bridge to the medalist whose own humanitarian contributions are recognized today. Raoul Wallenberg was born in 1912 into one of Sweden's most prominent families whose members included, besides bankers and financiers, bishops and diplomats and artists and professors. Gustav Wallenberg, in the role of guardian to his fatherless grandson, because Raoul's father died before Raoul was born, chose, the grandfather chose the University of Michigan over Harvard for Raoul's advanced education. <laughs> this, device, th this choice was based on the grandfather's conviction that an institution with a diverse student population and opportunities to mingle with students from different walks of life constitute the richest type of environment for learning. Accordingly, Wallenberg arrived here in 1931 to study architecture on this campus. And in 1935, he completed his undergraduate degree with honors. After graduation, Wallenberg returned to Sweden to pursue a career in banking, with employment in different parts of the world, including South Africa, Palestine, and several European countries. His first exposure to na Nazi atrocities committed against the Jews took place in Haifa. There, he worked for a bank and witnessed the arrival of many groups of Jewish refugees who had been forced to leave their native countries. A few years later, he became a partner of a Hungarian Jew in a trading company. And this position entailed considerable travel within Europe, at which time he also encountered uprooted Jewish families. Wallenberg's wartime experiences, his citizenship of a neutral country, whatever that means these days, his family background and other personal attributes qualified him to be appointed as a Swedish diplomat. In 1944, he was recruited by the American Refugee Board for a special assignment, namely to protect from execution the only substantial Jewish population still preserved in Europe, and these were the Jews in Budapest. During a brief six months period, from July 44 to January 1945, Wallenberg made his mark on history, concentrating on the rescue of tens of thousands of Jews from Nazi execution. He acted with boldness, persistence, and enormous courage. His innovative tactics included devising false protective passports called Schutzpässe and arranging for safe houses, which were Swedish properties designated as shelters for the Jews. Furthermore, Wallenberg is said to have performed his rescue operation almost single-handedly, thus providing a supreme example that no matter how formidable the odds, one person can make a difference. Wallenberg's example over 50 years ago is still relevant today. One person can make a difference in the struggle for a better world. And this is why Wallenberg is celebrated and his story is retold on this campus each year. 
Wallenberg's example symbolizes defiance in exposing tyranny, fortitude in defense of justice and human dignity, courage in a world trembling with fear, and steadfastness when the majority was apathetic and silent. It is gratifying to think that during Wallenberg's formative undergraduate years, this university helped shape the foundation of the monumental acts which followed. And thus, we regard Wallenberg as a lasting inspiration to each of us that we too can be that one person who makes a difference in building a better world. And I will now turn over the program to the president of the university, President Bollinger, who will introduce the speaker and present the medal. Thank you. I think of the Ralph Wallenberg lecture and medal uh, in this way. I think that it raises for us continuously in this campus and beyond a perennial and unfortunately everlasting question, which is what would we do if faced with a world of very great evil uh, and a cultural environment, especially a cultural environment uh, which supported that evil, how would we in fact respond? Uh, one of the great and, as I say, unfortunately enduring questions uh, of human existence. And it does seem to me the only right answer to give to that for most of us is, I just don't know. I hope that I would be able to respond in the same, in the right way. It is a great honor for me to introduce uh, this year's Wallenberg lecturer and winner of the Raoul Wallenberg Medal, Simka Kazik Rotem. Born in Poland, Kazik was 15 years old in 1939 when he watched the Germans enter Warsaw. He fought in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of 1943, defying the Nazis for almost a month. When the battle was lost, he helped lead the few surviving Jews out of the ruins of the ghetto to the air inside of Warsaw through the underground sewer canal system and then into the countryside. As head courier for the Jewish underground, he re-entered the ghetto when he learned that there were still some surviving Jews living in rubble and he led them out. Posing as a Gentile, Kazik worked with the Polish underground, joining in the Warsaw Uprising of 1944 against the Nazis. When this uprising failed, Kazik led members of the People's Army, the Polish Communists, to safety again through the sewer system. At the end of the war, he helped smuggle Jews out of Poland. Kazik has lived in Israel since 1946. In 1985, he was filmed speaking about his experiences in Claude Lanzmann's Holocaust documentary, Shoah. Now retired, he is the former president and CEO of a chain of Israeli supermarkets. He is the author of members, Memoirs of a Warsaw Ghetto Fighter, The Past Within Me, published in Hebrew and Polish, and in 1994 in English by the Yale University Press. The Wallenberg Medal honors those who exemplify the motto, one person can make a difference. But as I said, for me at least, the question is how would one respond in a situation of great evil? As I say, for most of us, I believe the answer is we don't know, but hope that we would respond correctly. Kotzik is able to answer that question in a way that all of us, I think, wish that we could. I am pleased to announce that he has donated the honorarium normally presented to the Wallenberg Lecturer to the university to be used for prizes for an essay contest for the University of Michigan and local high school students who will be asked to write about some aspect of the Holocaust. The details of this will be announced next year. Kasik, if you'll come to the podium 
it will be my honor to present you with the Wallenberg Medal. Thank you, President Boringer, Professor Bata, Dean Lewis. I would like to begin with a few personal remarks. One, <clears throat> you must excuse my English and even worse, my pronunciation. I am not a professional lecturer I am here because I believe it is my duty as a survivor of the Holocaust to tell people, and especially the young generation, what human beings are able to do to their fellows. Except for some historical facts, what I am going to share with you here comes from my personal experience and observations. I accept sole responsibility for the interpretations and observations that will follow in the course of this lecture. First, I would like to define what is resistance as I grasp it. Resistance, it is usually understood, is an organized military action undertaken by a group of people, civilians, with a weapon in hand based on military strategy. I would like to define the Jewish struggle to survive as a moral, spiritual, economical, cultural, political, or military action under, undertaken by individuals or a group of individuals who decided to disobey and to oppose the Nazi orders in every possible way, either passive or active. There were three channels for Jewish resistance. One, the uprisings in the ghettos, revolt took place in the following places, in the Warsaw Ghetto, Bialystok, Krakow, Vilna, Kovna, Minsk, Benjin, Częstochowa, and Sosnowiec. There were also revolts in at least eight other small towns. In Warsaw Ghetto, two separate revolts took place. The first one on January 18, 1943, and the second on April 19, 1943. The partisan war in the forest of Poland and two uprisings in the extermination camps, Auschwitz and Treblinka. Allow me to say immediately, I doubt that human beings other than <coughs> the Holocaust survivors can understand clearly the unique and impossible situation which we, the Jews, found ourselves during the occupation of Europe by the Germans. The physical and moral pressure we had to withstand during all the years of the German occupation is indeed beyond description. I doubt that the human vocabulary is capable of expressing the horrors we underwent during the Holocaust. But it is important to me to try to answer two questions which some people, Jews and non-Jews, don't dare to ask. Why did the Jews go like sheep to slaughter? 
what did they, why did they revolt so late? Before I answer these questions, the speed with which the Germans conquered Poland must be understood. With the German attack on Poland in September 1939, the Second World War began. The Germans conquered Poland in only four weeks. They took over one European country after another until the victorious armies reached Moscow. I am mentioning this fact because of their importance for understanding the events which took place later. At the end of September 1939, I was in the street with many others in Warsaw, watching the Germans entering Poland's capital. My first contact with the Germans made me terrified. I had a strong, unexplainable feeling of an impending disaster. The following day, the discriminatory attitude of the Germans against the Jews, as opposed to the Polish people, was obvious. They captured the Jews for work and insulted, abused religious Jews. They cut birds and earlocks and forced them to put on tefillim while the onlooking crowd laughed. Paul soon realized that a distinction was being made between them and the Jews. Much like many pogroms of the past, this distinction must have brought them some measure of relief and reassurance. Little by little, life in Warsaw stabilized. The shops opened, transportation began to operate, and the impression was that everything was returning to normal. But this was an, an illusion. Soon the prohibitions began for the Jews. One of the first prohibitions was the segregation of Jews in the public transportation system. Jews were marked by an armband with the Star of David. Eventually, the Jews were forced to move to a designated location at a specific date. And so the ghetto was established. During our almost a thousand year history of living in Poland, we were forced to accept antisemitism and discrimination in every domain of life. We historically had experienced and been forced to accept limitations for studying in the, at the universities, limitations in our choice of work and professions. For us, ghettos and killings were not something new. So we had the hope of remembering that during the First World War, uh, the Jews experienced relatively decent behavior of the Germans. When the killings began, this time we were confined to the ghettos. We thought that it was just another wave of an anti-Semitic outburst, which in time would pass. We had come to accept and expect that this time there would be hundreds, possibly even thousands, of people murdered. But as we were used to it in the past, we also believed that this would soon pass over and life would return to normal. Could any normal human being believe that in the heart of Europe, in the 20th century, the Germans, known to, the, to elder Jewish generations as gentlemen, 
would decide to exterminate the Jewish nation because they were Jewish? We didn't want to believe and we couldn't believe that this could even be the intention of this old cultured German nation. We also thought that the Germans wanted to appease the non-Jewish population in the occupied countries because they needed the cooperation of the non-Jews. They knew that the persecution of the Jews would be welcome. It must be emphasized that the Germans did their utmost to hide their true plans. The German gigantic propaganda machine was in full motion. They established in Poland two exemplary camps, Travniki and Poniatów. These camps served as a camouflage, both for the Jews and for the foreign visitors. Delegations of Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto were sent there to see what the camps were like. Indeed, upon their return to the ghetto, they confirmed that although it wasn't a first-class hotel, people worked and the conditions and the food were reasonable. The propaganda machine did everything possible to hide the true intentions concerning the Jews. There was also the death penalty for informing, helping, or hiding Jews. Jews sent to concentration camps were compelled to write many optimistic postcards which were sent to their families in the ghettos long after the authors of this postcard had been exterminated. I will speak mainly about the Warsaw Ghetto because I was there and saw with my own eyes the daily atrocities. The Warsaw Jews, plus the Jews from the surrounding areas, soon some 500,000 people were compressed into approximately a, a 3% of the city. To give you an idea what it means, the overall, overall Warsaw population before the war was about 1 million. It is hard to describe how overcrowded the ghetto was and to comprehend the unbearable conditions. We were torn out of our homes and surroundings. Hunger was taking its toll more and more. Starvation and epidemics like typhus plagued the ghetto. We were disconnected from sources of income and in order to survive, sold all we had. The Germans separated the elderly from the young, the healthy from the ill, the productive from the non-productive workers who could add the German cause from those who couldn't and were therefore a liability and a drain on the German cause. All of this created tremendous confusion among the Jews. They closed our schools and forbade all cultural activities. Every day brought new abuses and cruelty. The Germans excelled in deeds which were purely sadistic. The purpose behind those deeds was to leave us devoid of any feeling of human dignity and turn us into walking cadavers. Before the transportation to the death camps, 
in the hope that we would go as willing and complacent victims unable to offer resistance. The plan, of the, uh, the plan of extermination consisted of two stages. The first stage was the concentration of the Jews in ghettos, the breaking of their spirit and their will of resistance. The second stage was the deportation to the death camps. The Jewish resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto began with civil disobedience. At the same time, the first steps were made towards the establishment of the Jewish fighting organization. Illegal schools and cultural activities functioned from the beginning. Remember, in the beginning, we believed that this repression would follow the historical path of previous repressions and pogroms and that Ultimately, the survivors would be allowed to return to their homes and resume their normal lives. In the meantime, The smuggle began, and the, they were smuggled in bread and potatoes mainly, although never enough to prevent hunger. Community aid was organized. During the first year of life in the ghetto, everyone tried to survive in spite of very difficult conditions. Small children and youngsters were especially helpful. They endangered their lives on a daily basis in their attempts to smuggle food into the ghetto through holes made in the wall, which was built to cut us off from the outside world. Those children would escape to the Aryan site and sell various personal belongings that we still had. These few precious belongings were traded for bread and potatoes. Whenever caught by the Germans, these courageous and unsung heroes were shot on the spot. This was the general background preceding the first massive deportation in July 1942. The Germans promised six pounds of bread and some jam to each person who would voluntarily appear for deportation at the Umschlagplatz deportation point. This promise of food was enough to convince thousands and tens of thousands of hungry people to turn themselves in for deportation to the camps. I am not sure that you can understand what real hunger during a long period of time can do to a human being. With time, we succeeded in sending an emissary to observe one of the transports. The man returned and reported that he saw the train going into the camp and after a short time leaving empty. He couldn't see anymore but the smell of burnt human flesh taught him the unbearable truth. Some of the peasant, peasants living close to the camp confirmed his suspicions. 
more than 300,000 Jews were sent to and exterminated in Treblinka. Even after this deportation, most of the population did not believe that the Germans planned to annihilate the Jews. But at this stage, we decided to revolt in spite of the fact that we did not possess the basic conditions needed to stage a revolt. We didn't have weapons, military trained fighters, friendly land base from which we could prepare and organize an uprising. The sort of fighting in the ghetto was totally unrealistic and contrary to everything the word ghetto represents. We still had to overcome the heated debate of whether we had the moral right to take upon ourselves the responsibility for the life of some still existing 60, 70,000 inhabitants. It was clear to us that we had no chance against the German army. It was clear to us that nobody would remain, remain alive. It was only a question of how we should die, we would die. Did we have the moral right to decide to begin a revolt which would result in certain deaths of everyone remaining in the ghetto? However, we couldn't wait any longer and decided to act. Our first task was to obtain web weapons. The possibilities were limited. We got some from the Polish underground, bought them illegally and made others ourselves. The ones we were able to make included grenades, Molotov cocktails and mines. We devoted much thought, energy and effort to the confrontation we would have with the Germans when the time came. We dug a long tunnel under the road from the entrance gate to our position tens of yards away. This was the gate through which the Germans would usually enter the ghetto. We took into account that the date of the final liquidation of the ghetto was imminent. We worked very hard to dig this tunnel because we lacked the proper equipment and needed to remove the gravel slowly in order not to attract attention. When we finished, we prepared a surprise for the Germans. A bomb which could be activated from afar at the chosen time. On April 19, at 4 a.m., we saw hundreds of German soldiers entering through the ghetto gate. There were many tanks, armored vehicles, light artillery, artillery and waffenesses on motorcycles. But we did not lose our spirit. Finally, the time came to settle the account. After a few days of heavy fighting inside the ghetto, which resulted in many German dead, the Germans changed their tactics and began to destroy the ghetto from the outside. 
they used flamethrowers, artillery, and air attacks. Finally, sappers were sent to set fires and explode every cellar and bunker. In this terrible situation, we had no delusions about the future of the burning ghetto and about the outcome of the fight. On April 29, our command staff decided to find a way to rescue the remaining fighters. I would like to point out that during the preparations for the uprising, no thought was given to the possibility of retreat. We didn't believe that any of us would remain alive. Several attempts were made to send emissaries to the Aryan site in order to contact a liaison with the Polish underground. All the attempts failed. At the end of April, it was decided to try again. A friend and I were chosen for the mission. We used a tunnel which led out of the ghetto. We found it by chance when looking for a way out. We assembled a few items we might need on the Aryan site. We did not have any identity papers. We said goodbye, descended into the tunnel, and there we were on the Aryan site. We hid in an attic until morning because it was better not to walk around outside after curfew. At dawn, we peeked outside. All of a sudden, a pole appeared in one of the doorways. I spontaneously made up a story. The two of us had got stuck with the Jews in the ghetto before the uprising, where we had come in to deal in clothes, and this got caught in the uprising. Only now, did we manage to get out of the ghetto? The man who was convinced congratulated us on our success in getting out of the ghetto and even told us how to get out of the building without running into nearby German patrols, whose function, he said, was to guard the ghetto from the outside. We followed the man's instructions and succeeded to get out of the building. But we hadn't gone far when a group of blackmailers, opportunists, recognized immediately that we were Jews and tried to extort whatever we had. We don't have anything valuable we didn't have anything valuable, and I realized that if we didn't get rid of them, they would turn us over to the Germans. I glanced to the side, thoughts went quickly through my head. Promptly, we ran and grabbed onto a passing truck from behind. By the time the blackmailers understood what was going on, we were far away. The truck picked up speed as we hung on. At the corner, the truck slowed down and we jumped off without getting hurt. After walking fast and stiffly, although we were weak after several days of not eating, we reached the flat of my companion's friends. We washed and changed our clothes. This was my first shower in two weeks, and it was an opportunity not only to wash my body, 
but also to restore my soul. When I went into the bright bathroom covered with tiles and was given soap and a fragrant towel, it was like a dream. It was hard for me to believe that just a few hours before I had been in another world between the crumbling walls of the ghetto where everything beyond the walls seemed inaccessible. We were invited to the dining room to a table covered with white clothes loaded with food. The welcome of the two women whom I had just met dazzled me, but I didn't forget why we had come. That very day, we were sent to an apartment which became a base of operations to rescue the fighters left behind in the ghetto. We contacted the Jewish fighting organization's representative and we met that afternoon with several others. We reported on the situation in the ghetto speaking in disjointed fragments, piling details on top of one another. We named each one who was killed. We described the deployment of the fighting groups, told of the systematic destruction, the hopelessness of the situation. We focused our discussion on saving our companions. In my simplicity, I thought there would be an immediate solution. But it was soon apparent that nobody was standing around waiting for us on the Aryan side. And that we would have to do everything by ourselves. I believe there were some people, after all, who could help. Our essential problems were how to get back to the ghetto, how to bring the fighters out of the ghetto, how to get transportation, and where to hide them after we got them out. The key to the solution was making contact with sewer workers who could lead us back to the ghetto on a route we could also use to remove those who had survived. From that point on, every one of us using connections on the Aryan side looked for vehicles to transport the fighters, if we managed to get them out, and searched for guides to the source. We knew the destruction in the ghetto was continuing, and that every moment was crucial. We met every day to consult and report on our efforts. I used to leave the apartment in the morning and come back before Kufu. I ran around like a maniac with Juan goal in my mind, rescuing those who were left an impossible mission under those circumstances. We contacted some sewer workers, but at the last minute they decided not to take the risk. No one doubted that getting into the burning ghetto when the Germans were systematically destroying all its inhabitants involved mortal danger. We finally made contacts with the king of the blackmailers who extorted money from Jews. Gradually, a plan to get the fighter out of the ghetto took shape. We needed an exit base from where we could descend into the sewers 
a guide through the sewers and transportation to take them from the sewer opening to the forest. Two days later, we were prepared to put the plan into action. The king of blackmailers agreed to help us for a stiff amount of money and with our solemn promise that their help would be inscribed as an act of patriotism in the books of the Polish resistance history. His apartment would serve as the base from which we would go down to the sewers. He wasn't supposed to know we were rescuing Jews. So we concocted the story that a group of Poles had gone into the ghetto before the uprising and got stuck there. That we were acting on behalf of the Polish underground and, then, and that since we no, now know exactly where the group is, we plan to get them out. On the night of May 7, an advanced group went to the ghetto. To our great disappointment, they returned soon after because the sewers were blocked. The Germans were posted at the sewer exit, tossing grenades in, spraying the sewer with bullets whenever they heard the echo of footsteps and hanging poison gas containers inside. The next night, another group was formed under my command. The two sewer workers, another boy, and I went, and went in and turned toward the ghetto. It was 10 o'clock night and pitch dark in the sewers. Before we descended into the sewer, the king of the blackmailers began to suspect that I was a Jew and to doubt the truth of the story about rescuing Christians. I asked him to postpone his investigation until after I came back. We started walking. The central sewer in Warsaw is about two meters high and the sewage streams in a mighty flow. The side channels are small and we sometimes had to crawl on our bellies to get through them. It was no pleasure to flounder in excrement, to smell the stench, but we had no choice. The walking itself went on too long. The guides changed their minds from time to time and straightened it to desert us. I gave them drinks, I talked to them nicely and nastily. I straightened them with my gun and in this manner we advanced. At a certain moment they said, we are inside the ghetto. I climbed up the iron ladder on the wall of the sewer. My companion stayed below to keep them from taking off. I lifted the manhole cover and found that we really were in the ghetto, a few meters away from the gate. It was 2 o'clock a.m. I had to crawl on my belly to avoid a searchlight. I had a few addresses of our fighting groups. First, I made my way to the supply cellar from where I had left for the Aryan site. I entered the yard but found only the ruins of the shelter. Apparently, the Germans had discovered it. 
Among the ruins, I found two men and a woman, not human beings, but ghosts. The woman was mourning because her leg was broken. I wanted to take them with me to the Aryan site but they didn't have the strength to stand up. They told me the fighters had fought a battle with a few dozen of Germans. As one of, of the fighters lay wounded, he had invited the Germans to approach, but they were afraid to come close to him. When his strength ran out and he stopped shooting, a German, stopped him with his bayonet. I left those poor people to their fate and went on. I didn't recognize the bunkers in the yard. I signaled with my flashlight, called my companions and gave our password. The ghetto was completely burned down. Piles of corpses were left abundant in the streets, in the yards, and among the heaps of ruins. A sudden calm surrounded me. I felt so good among the ruins of the ghetto, <clears throat> near the corpses that were between sanity and madness, between this world and the next. I had begun to lose all thoughts of survival. My only thoughts were of retaliation and revenge. With a sudden effort, I wrenched myself free of thoughts of suicide and decided to return to the source. The closer I got to the manhole cover, the brighter were the searchlights in the area because the German position was close to the entrance of the ghetto. I crawled the last part of the way and finally managed to slither into the sewer. I went down and closed the cover. Let's go. There's, there's nobody there. The shout leaped out of my mouth. It wasn't my voice. It wasn't a human voice. It was aimed at my friend and the sewer workers who were waiting for me. We started back. As we walked, I signaled with my flashlight in case someone remained in hiding there. Suddenly, I heard a noise in a side door. I thought I could make out a flickering light. Were they Germans or Jews? My nerves were stretched to the limit. My finger caressed the trigger of my gun. I was ready to shoot, but something stopped me. I waited and repeated the password of the organization. The tension mounted from the side saw a group of 10 fighters burst out. For a few moments, we were petrified. Was this a dream? Everyone wanted to hug me. A few minutes later, I found out we were late by only one day, which I will explain later. On the spot, I sent two of that group back to the ghetto to round up the remaining fighters and bring them to the sewer. One of them was my best friend. We had been inseparable until I left for the Aryan site. I gave clear instructions. 
when you come back from the ghetto, stay together in the sewer as close as possible to the exit. I emphasized that they were absolutely not to disperse into the side sewers. I promised to lead the way and even to put fighters to guide them at junctions where they might get lost. On the way through the sewer, my comrades told me what had happened to them and described the eight days since I had been out of the ghetto. The main underground shelter was discovered only on May 8. The bunker was surrounded, and when the ventilating slits were found, the Germans spewed poison gas into them. Almost 100 members of the Jewish fighting organization were gathered in the bunker, including Mordechai Anielewicz, its chief commander. Hungry, broken, hopeless, some of the fighters committed suicide. Others tried to break out and fell dead at the entrance of the bunker. On the 10th of May, we succeeded in rescuing about 40 fighters from the sewers and bring them to safety in a forest near Warsaw. Fifteen fighters were killed. I would like to end this tale by paying tributes to the righteous among the nations. They were not many, but each one was a special human being ready to sacrifice his and his family's life to help Jews to survive. They provided shelter, food, and transportation in the most difficult conditions. One of them was Raoul Wallenberg, who saved thousands of Jews in Hungary. We shall always remember and be grateful for their deeds. The Holocaust left terrible memories. The most painful one torments me to this day, and I suppose forever. One night, I was on patrol in the nearly completely destroyed ghetto. I came upon a heap of human bodies. There was a sound of crying. A dead mother still holding a baby. I stopped for a moment and went away. The Germans succeeded not only to annihilate the Jews, but to rob me of my humanity. Thank you. speakers agree to answer a few questions I would only ask that you be brief there are mics on either side there are two mics uh, there will be opportunity as well uh, in a reception on the fourth floor in assembly hall that will immediately follow to answer other questions uh, I also ask that you not only uh, be brief but be also very succinct in terms of framing a question uh, and recognizing that uh, he is coming uh, here from Israel and is working through two or three languages uh, trying to understand what it is you want to ask. Are there questions?
may be the most bashful audience we've had in a long time. <laughs> My name? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Could you come to one of the mics if possible? I, it's hard to see from way in the back. Thank you. My name is Joe Mazur. I'm from uh, Roseville, Michigan, and I'm very pleased that uh, I came here this evening to hear you speak. Now, I expect to be going to uh, Poland uh, this coming spring and spend some time in Warsaw, and I would like to know if there are today any uh, memorials or markings or indications of anything to commemorate uh, the uh, the the ghetto. Uh, is there anything that I could uh, look? I wouldn't want to say look forward to, but uh, look to uh, see the particular area and the surroundings where all this occurred. Thank you. Yes, there is a memorial in the city of Warsaw in a place which was the ghetto, used to be the ghetto. The memorial is made by uh, the sculpture Rappaport, dedicated to the ghetto fighters. And there are some places which can be seen, in some places there still exist uh, <clears throat> uh, remained a place with the wall which separated us from the Aryan site. Would you, please, would you please tell us something about how between May of 43 and the Polish uprising in 1944, you and other fighters in Warsaw were able to survive on the Aryan side? And can you tell us also something about the people with whom you worked? I'm thinking of Adina Blatis Weiger, Rissa Feinmesser, uh, other people who were couriers as well. I, I, didn't, I didn't get clearly the question. I heard only a part of it. How did we manage? How did you manage to survive in hiding on the Aryan side yeah. from the destruction of the ghetto to the Polish uprising? And can you tell us about the other people with whom you worked who were couriers? Uh, Inka, uh, Mauricia, Vladka. <clears throat> we uh, had a very hard time. It was very dangerous. Many of our people were found in, in the hidden places and they were turned over to the Germans and killed. I know the names, you mentioned Inka and Marisha and Vladka and some others. Uh, we, of course, uh, functioned as non-Jews. We had a Polish identity cards and we had very much luck. Excuse me, is it true that the streetcars went right through the ghetto and that the, the Warsaw citizens saw, could see everything that was in the ghetto? And also that there was, I had heard that there was a Ferris wheel that went with children up and they could look down and see everything that was in the, in other words, the people knew. Or did, is that true or was that some sort of legend? Right 
Yes, it's, uh, it's true. The street car the went through the ghetto. It won't allow to stop inside the ghetto because it was, the ghetto was a part of the city. So some places, to reach them, you have to go through the ghetto. And <clears throat> the street guard was watched over by the Polish police that nobody will uh, got into the front of the ghetto and nobody from the street guard won't stop into the ghetto. That's true, yes. Good evening. It's a, it's a real honor to hear you tonight. Um, I, I can't hear you, sorry. It's a real honor to hear you tonight. Um, if you'd like afterwards, I will repeat my, my question in Hebrew. Um, in one of the courses here at University of Michigan, um, Perspectives on the Holocaust uh, in the Near Eastern Studies Department, we've read a historian by the name of Raoul Hilberg, um, who has said in his book, The Destruction of the European Jews, that the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising uh, was insignificant. And as I see you here tonight, um, it does not seem insignificant to me at all. I was wondering how you feel about that statement and whether you could add some more personal remarks about uh, your family and your life in Israel. I can't, uh, I don't know why he thinks it insignificant. If in the meaning, from military point of view, of course it was insignificant. We didn't have, I, I, I said it before, I mentioned it, that we didn't have any chance against the German army. But it was very significant from the point of view of to rise a <clears throat> to fight the Germans in the ghetto. The, to try at the last moment to choose the way, for us it was very significant, to choose the way how to die. We didn't want to go to the crematorium. We didn't want to be taken out again like it was in 1942 when the first uh, action began and at that time the Germans succeeded to take out from the ghetto about 300,000 Jews and, and <clears throat> to the uh, uh, Treblinki. I would like to I would like to ask you if you got any help at all from the Polish government in emigration in London at all or you had any connection with them. <coughs> the, the government the Polish government there was a Polish government in London <coughs> was the emigrant government did they help at all any any of you uh, any of the Jews. That was a, a Christian government, Poles. We had some help from the Polish underground. Uh, we got from them uh, weapons, a small amount. They were against our uprising for political points of view, 
they didn't want it, and that's why they didn't help us very much. Uh, I don't know uh, <clears throat> if they had some orders from the Polish government in exile. I have no idea. But in Warsaw or in other places, we were helped in a very, very small way. This is not a question, but a brief comment. I think that the question about significance of the uprising should not obscure the fact that Kaji Krotem is a hero, not because he was a fighter, but because he is a rescuer, and because he survived and it symbolizes the efforts of survivors who managed to stay alive and bear witness to what has happened. That's what makes him a true hero, at least in my mind. I just wanted to know if any of your family members had survived. Yes, my family members, I don't know many families like mine. I knew some others too. Uh, my father and mother and one of my sisters survived. I had another brother and another sister. But none of the families, both sides, from my father and my mother, none of them survived. Thank you for your attendance and please join us on the fourth floor. Good night.